Hello, friends. I'd like to take a few moments to talk to you about the coming of our Lord and Savior, Gaia BH3, who is coming to save our souls for its harvest, along with pretty much everything else in its path. Hello, hello, what's up, f***ers? I'm uh, breaking my own cardinal rule today in having my windows open and the blinds open too, but this episode is about black holes and it's dark and weird, so let's go. Okay, so joining an apocalypse on a living cult following some dark deity isn't high up on my bucket list. That's because Gaia BH3 isn't some flavor of the week doomsday apocalypse god. It's a black hole. And cosmically speaking, it's really f***ing close. Now before I tell you all about this cosmic drain sucking up literal existence itself, I want to take a moment to establish a ruler of sorts. A cosmic yardstick, if you will, so that we are all on the same page about the numbers and distances that I'm going to be throwing at you. In our universe, particles that don't have any mass whatsoever, protons, gluons, gravitons, travel at 186,000 miles per second through the vacuum of space. It's the cosmic speed limit, give or take a couple hundred miles. Now photons are something most of us have experienced pretty much every day of our lives, unless you live in Russia. If you told those same people that we called the cosmic speed limit the speed of gluons, they would politely respond, what the f*** is a gluon? Hence, we call the cosmic speed limit the speed of light. Things in space are so incredibly far apart that we use the distance light travels in a single year as a unit of measurement. It's like saying a mile or a city block. So, as an example, our sun is eight light minutes from Earth. Light leaving the sun takes eight minutes to reach Earth. The nearest star is 4.3 light years away. And the center of the Milky Way galaxy, along with its supermassive black hole, 26,000 light years away. And Gaia BH3, 2,000 light years away. It's right around the corner. There are literally so many facts about black holes that I thought it'd be kind of cool to do a speed run on all the different ways that a black hole can unsubscribe you from life. There is an area around a black hole just above the point of no return called the photon sphere, where gravity is strong enough to pull literal light into orbit around it, which is why they have that characteristic ring of light around them when they eat. Theoretically, you could orbit a black hole here and see the back of your own spacecraft as you do so because of the gravitational lensing. Essentially, light moves along curved space like it does around any lens. Unfortunately, thanks to the friction created by you and all the other stuff the black hole is eating moving so quickly, you'd evaporate immediately. The angular momentum at a black hole, the speed at which you spin around it, is so immense that you'd more than likely be thrown from its orbit at relativistic speeds. So not only did you lose time at the black hole due to its gravity, but you're also losing time from moving so fast and you likely wouldn't have enough fuel to stop or slow down unless you smashed into something and at those speeds, the kinetic energies involved would turn you, the thing you hit, and the cosmic neighborhood into nothing immediately. Time dilation is insane at a black hole, which means if you were flying into one and the front of your ship is closer to the black hole than the back, and let's say you store your food, oxygen, and other necessities near the back of the ship, they would not only go bad extremely quickly from your perspective, but depending on how close you are to the black hole, they might even start to experience nuclear decay. As you sail further into the black hole, you'd watch the whole history of the universe unfold as its time speeds up compared to yours, which means even if you pull off the snowball's chance in hell scenario where you escape, the universe and everything and everyone in it will be long dead leaving you alone and in the dark to ponder your existence. Let's say you somehow find a way to make it to the center of the black hole. The gravity is so intense and so crushing that the laws of physics apparently break down, so who knows? Maybe you're crushed, again, or maybe you turn into some kind of alternate reality paint blob person who looks vaguely like Benedict Cumberbatch. Some black holes can pull harder at your feet than at your head, causing you, or whatever they're eating, to spaghettify. Yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. They emit enough high-intensity electromagnetic waves that you'd be cooked before you could even get near them. Now before you go breaking out your trusty Kool-Aid packs, you should know that no object with any mass whatsoever can move anywhere near the speed of light, which means that it's going to take this black hole a lot longer than 2,000 years to reach us. And that's assuming it's coming straight at us in the first place. Realistically speaking, 
actually maybe optimistically speaking, if you're the black hole and you're hungry, if this black hole was heading directly toward Earth at the same speed at which Earth travels around the sun, let's say about 70,000 miles per hour, it would still take 10,000 years to reach us. Now, I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but we might be gone next year. <laughs> Thankfully for us, Gaia BH3 has better to do than fixing up our galactic whole planet. Gaia BH3 is what's known as a stellar mass black hole. It came from the death of a star. And since the star that created this black hole wasn't coming for Earth, it's not gonna make nom noms out of our favorite planet. So what is a black hole? Are there explainers in English? Their gravity is so strong that they suck in light. So to us, a black hole is basically just a black circle in space. However, the same gravity that makes these black holes invisible to us spins the things it eats around it so fast, including planets, stars, gas clouds, and other cosmic nom-noms, that they create a friction which causes them to superheat into a very bright plasma. And the energy of the light the plasma emits is in the X-ray spectrum. And while we can't see X-rays, we have a lot of telescopes that can. So while you can't see the black hole itself, if it's eating, you can see the accretion disk, a giant ring made up of gas and other particles that are superheated to a plasma state. The biggest misconception about black holes is that it's not really an object, it's a hole in space-time, the fabric of reality itself. How does that even work? Well, as I said earlier, most black holes are born when a star dies. Stars are basically a big hydrogen gas cloud in space that compresses under gravity as it gets bigger. Over time, this gravitational attraction pulls these hydrogen atoms closer and closer together, and eventually, so much hydrogen forms and there's so much force pushing down toward the center of this cloud that these hydrogen atoms start smashing into each other and the star ignites. The nuclear furnace of the star smashes hydrogen atoms together, creating helium atoms out of the two hydrogen atoms, and a spare neutron out of the process. Essentially what's happening is you're putting in less energy than you get on the other side of the reaction. And this is the star's main sequence. It's where it spends most of its life. And as the main sequence comes to an end, that hydrogen the star was making into helium is now being burned into other things like oxygen and carbon and so on and so forth. Essentially, the star goes up the periodic table of elements making heavier and heavier elements until it makes iron and then it dies. Iron is essentially star poison because when you smash two iron atoms together, you get less energy out of the reaction than it takes to make the reaction in the first place. So this enormous, massive star that was fighting off the downward pressure of gravity with the outward pressure of its nuclear furnace now no longer has a furnace to fight gravity with and what ends up happening is the star collapses. Here's an easy way to look at what's happening. Think of this shitty old tennis ball that my dog has had tons of sex with as the outer layers of a star. Once the star makes iron and its internal furnace loses pressure, the tennis ball, aka the outer layers of the star, drops. In stars below a certain size, the tennis ball reaches the ground, or the core of the star, and it'll bounce back. That explosion of the star's outer gas layers becomes a nova, or a supernova explosion, and the star's outer gas layer rebounds out into space, and you get a nebula like these. However, given a big enough star, the tennis ball becomes more of a wrecking ball and you're dropping it from orbit. The star is so massive that there is no rebound. It punches a hole in the very fabric of space-time, like a bullet passing through aluminum foil. The life of a black hole is eternal, but simultaneously, really, really short. Because a black hole is essentially a hole in space-time, pictured here as a two-dimensional funnel, the closer you get to a black hole, the slower time moves for you. And today I'm the age you were when you left. Remember, it's not just a hole in space, it's also a hole in time. 
So thanks to the insane amount of gravity a black hole generates, and how fast you orbit the black hole because of said gravity, time will begin to slow down for you as you get closer to it. You won't feel time slowing down though. To you, that Apple Watch is ticking away the seconds the same as ever. But to someone outside the gravitational influence of the black hole, they would just see you slow down progressively until as you reach the event horizon, you're basically on pause. They will never see you cross into the black hole's event horizon. Your light will just shift into the red until you disappear completely from view. The point of no return. Meanwhile, for you on your spaceship, as you cross over the event horizon into this interstellar Dyson vacuum cleaner, you stop seeing the hole as being a circle in front of you, and it actually starts to consume your view. And space, where you just were, is now the circle and it's behind you. And if you're looking closely, you can see that the entire history of the universe plays out in fast forward. That's time dilation. And even though for you time feels normal, outside of the black hole, in order for the universe to make logical sense, time has to go faster. This is where things go from weird to it, Bill, you file the report, I'm getting out of here and getting a margarita. We have no idea what happens inside of the event horizon of a black hole. No light gets out. We need light to see, and without it, it's basically a giant question mark. Normally in science, this is where theoretical physics and math come to the rescue, but much like a millennial trying to balance a checkbook, it's not gonna work. For starters, the laws of physics as we know them work inside our universe. They are its foundation. But a black hole is a literal hole in the fabric of space-time. We don't know where it goes. And because of that, we don't even know if our physics works there. The singularity at the center of the black hole is so microscopic that you would need quantum physics to describe it. Which is a real buzzkill, because our quantum physics math game is no match for this black hole singularity. This is a cosmic service announcement. A singularity is an infinitely tiny point, so small and so massive that it effectively breaks a hole into the fabric of reality or space-time. A singularity begins life as a star that is tens, hundreds, thousands, or even millions of times more massive than our sun before the death of that star allows gravity to crush it into a microscopic point that maintains the original star's mass. Singularities are so massive that within them, even the fundamental laws of physics, space-time, and matter are crushed into pure energy. Remember, if you see something, say something. Singularities are dangerous. So now we have a stellar mass black hole, and these are already pretty big. For example, our dark overlord Gaia BH3, it's 33 times bigger than our sun. The sun is about 330,000 miles wide, compared to Earth, which is a very cozy and very livable 8,000 miles wide. But remember how I told you that time slows down as you get closer to a black hole? Because of this, black holes, to us as outsiders, basically seem to last forever. And as a result, they have a ton of time to eat everything around them. Because of this, a black hole seen from the outside will basically outlive the entire universe. Long after all the stars have blinked out and the universe goes into heat death, they'll still be there. And with this extra time comes extra opportunities to eat more cosmic stuff, including other black holes. And when this happens, you get supermassive black holes. Sagittarius A star is the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. We suspected it might have been there, but we found out for sure when we saw stars orbiting it. Specifically one star that ripped around the most hairpin turn in the entire universe at the most ridiculous speed ever. And we knew that given the mass and size of that star, there's only one way it was going to do that. Remember the tennis ball from earlier? Well, several astronomers, physicists, quantum physicists, and incels who judge every Star Trek movie and show's script as though they can do a better job, believe that the black holes do in fact rebound into structures known as white holes. By the way, don't Google that term in front of mixed company because you've got a 50-50 chance of getting... not science. And while black holes are inescapable, you'll never be able to make your way back into a white hole after it's ejected you. Essentially, a black hole is like being at the top of the slide, where the only way you can go is down. 
the white hole is more like the bottom of the slide where you'll never be able to slide back up. Now, we haven't yet observed any white holes in our universe, but we think there's a pretty good reason for that. First, let me tell you the story of a very beautiful birth. There was a singularity, an infinitely tiny and dense point that contained so much energy packed so tightly within itself that it flashed and exploded. Within the tiniest fractions of a second, this energy expanded forth from this explosion, beginning to cool as it did so. As the pressure and temperatures dropped, space-time began to form. The fundamental forces began to separate out. Gravity, the strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force. Then in time, as the energy cooled, it began to condense into the first quarks and gluons. Then those particles combined to become protons and neutrons. As temps continued to fall, protons and neutrons began to interact and come together to create atoms. Atoms became molecules, and those simple hydrogen molecules became giant clouds of gas that collapsed under gravity to form the first stars. Now that's obviously a very, very abridged version of what happens, but when you look at it, it kind of looks like the rebound of a black hole. Now, from the perspective of the black hole, this whole process happens immediately, kind of like bouncing the tennis ball off the driveway. However, because black holes distort not only our spatial dimensions, but also our time dimension under their massive gravity, they look eternal to us, but in reality, they're not. And there's a really good chance that as all these black holes start to come together to form supermassive black holes, you essentially get one big bang somewhere else. Some when else. A whole new universe. And while this may be hard for you to understand, I mean, where the shit is this new universe gonna form? It's important to understand that because the universe is 10 to 12 dimensional and we only occupy three of those dimensions physically, plus our time dimension, and because black holes distort space-time enough to make it seem like the outcomes of their ultimate white hole aftermath is basically an eternity away, there isn't a conflict as far as there being enough space for a new universe to form. Maybe it exists further down in time than ours does. Maybe it exists in these eight or nine other spatial dimensions we don't have access to. Likewise, we know that given enough time, most black holes will merge into bigger, supermassive black holes, and those supermassive black holes will merge into even bigger ones still. It isn't hard to imagine that by the end of our universe, a few, or even one, ultra, supermassive black hole could potentially contain most or all of the universe's energy and mass packed into its singularity ready to create the next universe, hence the light at the end of the tunnel. So while the idea of a swirling mass of pitch black death swallowing up everyone and everything you love, including reality and time itself, might sound terrifying, understand that there's a pretty good chance that this is how the universe formed, and the last one, and the one before that, and the one after this. For all you know, we've probably been here and done all this before, many, many times. After all, a well-thrown tennis ball has more than one bounce in it. Thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate you tuning in to check out this video. As always, like and subscribe, that kind of thing helps us out. And if you have any questions or comments, if you think I'm totally off my rocker or if you want to correct me, and especially if you want to give us ideas on what you want to see next, hit us up in the comment section.